Yeah, um, welcome everyone to our quantum science seminar number 56, which is our fourth hot topics session. And actually, for some reason, this is not changing to me. Okay, sorry, it seems uh, on YouTube to be okay, but not on Zoom live. Okay, good, uh, whatever. Um, yeah, so, uh, so it was the fourth hot topic session of the quantum science seminar. We have uh, three young researchers speaking about their recent results today. Um, that's uh, Paula Garcia Molina, uh, Gary Afek, and uh, Chi Shu in this order. And uh, we jump in the talks right away. And uh, the first speaker will be um, Paula, Paula Garcia uh, Mo, uh, Molina, um, talking about variational quantum algorithm for eigenvalue problems of a class of Schrodinger type partial differential equations. So, Paula, it's stage is yours. Yes, I just share my screen. Thank you for this kind introduction. Um, one moment. So, well, thank you for bringing me the opportunity to be here to share our recent research on a variational quantum algorithm for eigenvalue problems of a class of Schrodinger type partial differential equations that was done in collaboration with Javier Rodriguez Villavilla and Juan Jose Garcia Ripoll. I would like to start by introducing the field of quantum numerical analysis, which is one of the main fields in the development of quantum algorithms. In this area, quantum computers assist in the resolution of problems such as linear, nonlinear, and differential equations, and also systems of equations. In fact, one of the turning points in this area was the development of the HHL algorithm for solving linear systems of equations. This algorithm is not only suitable for this task, but it can also be extended to the resolution of differential equations as they can be rewritten in the form of a linear system. Since then, a great deal of effort has been put into the development of this technique for solving both ordinary and partial differential equations. However, there is a drawback when it comes to these HHL-based methods, and it is that in spite of the theoretical quantum speed up provided by them, the current limitations of these devices in the number of qubits and the number of quantum gates may not feasible for the implementation of such algorithms. So to solve quantum numerical analysis within the NISC era limitations, we have to find an alternative proposal. And one of the main proposals is the use of variational hybrid quantum classical algorithms that combine the use of a quantum and a classical computer to solve a certain task. This way, this kind of algorithms have shown a strong noise resilience together with a lower hardware requirements which make them suitable for the state of the art. Our aim is to develop an algorithm of this kind to solve partial differential equations by using a space equation and set set that merge a structural quantum circuit for cost screening with Fourier-based interpolation. The kind of equations of PDEs that we are aiming to solve are of this form in which the solution is defined over a regular domain in which it is periodic and bandwidth limited. Moreover, the operators, the different operators that comprise the PDE are real functions. If these requirements are met, we can assume that the PDE is a lower bounded Hamiltonian operator of this form and the resolution of the PDE has been transformed into the seek of the ground state of this Hamiltonian. This is the one that corresponds to the minimum energy. By doing this, now our problem admits a variational formulation and can be solved using a variational algorithm. The algorithm that we propose is what we have called the variational quantum PD solver, and here we can see its general structure. First, we start by preparing the quantum circuit that it is going to encode the solution of the PDE in the form of a variational quantum circuit. The next step is to measure this circuit and use these measurements to estimate the expectation values of the operators that comprise the PDE. Then, these values are given to the classical computer in which the energy associated to this quantum state is estimated. And here we find one of the limitations of this variational method. And it is that as the number of measurements is finite, we cannot compute the exact energy, but just an estimation of it with a certain uncertainty. 
Then, this video is the energy is used as the cost function of a classical optimizer that updates the parameters of the variational quantum circuit. This process is iteratively repeated until convergence. And for the final values of the parameters, we have that the solution of the PDE is encoded in the quantum circuit. Now, we are going to introduce the tools that we have used to develop this algorithm. First, in order to map continuous functions to quantum registers, we discretize the position spacing due to the endpoints that correspond to the quantum state of an n qubit quantum register. Then, this map is used to find the quantum representation of the operators that comprise the PDE. For the position space one, the representation is trivial, but when it comes to the momentum space operator, we have to develop a different mapping for the quasi momentum. In addition, this is the operator that encloses the derivative, and to perform it in position space, we resort to the Fourier transform and its inverse. Finally, in order to approximate the exact solution of the PDE, which is a continuous function, we have to use Fourier interpolation. It allows us to obtain an infinitely differentiable function from the momentum space discretization solution that our algorithm provides. This is possible because, because we have a sufficiently small discretization step together with a bandwidth limited function. The way of computing this operation in a quantum computer is by using the following quantum circuit. First, we apply the quantum Fourier transform onto the solution for n qubits. And then in the momentum space, we add the points for the interpolation by adding the corresponding quantum registers. Finally, in order to obtain the interpolated solution in position space, we applied the inverse Fourier transform in the whole quantum registers. Once we know how to do this mapping, in order to encode the solution in the form of a quantum circuit, we use what we have called the ZGR ansatz, a variational quantum circuit based on the one proposed by Salka, Gruber, and Rudolph to encode non-negative probability distribution in a quantum register. In this ansatz, conditional rotations are applied on top of the previous ones in a smooth and easily differentiable fashion, and hence there is no loss of information, making it suitable for the representation of continuous functions. However, there is a drawback when it comes to this ansatz, and it is that the number of parameters scales exponentially with the number of qubits, making it very costly. To lessen this inconvenience, what we propose is to embed the symmetries of the function in a quantum circuit. This is possible if we have reflection symmetry and also a symmetrized discretization position space. By doing this, we can apply the following quantum circuit that allows us to encode the n qubit solution using the ansatz for n minus one qubits and hence reducing the cost. Once the theory has been presented, we are ready to benchmark this algorithm solving the Schrodinger equation of the one-dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator. We can see here, the corresponding one rare state is a trivial Gaussian, which is real, even asymmetric, and hence can be represented by the previously mentioned ansatz. In addition, in this case, we can modify the length in the position space according to the Nagyshan theorem, and make it depend on the number of qubits, so we can maximize the accuracy in both position and momentum spaces. We also introduced two figures of merit for the comparison of the results that we will obtain for the resolution of such equation. First, in order to determine the precision in the estimation of that solution, we use the continuous fidelity that computes the fidelity between the exact theoretical solution of the PDE and the one obtained from the interpolation of the discretized solution provided by the algorithm. This allows us to determine how much information from the theoretical solution we can recover from this discretized one. We are also interested in how well can we estimate the properties of such solution. And in order to account for that, we also compute the relative error in the computation of the energy. First, I'm going to show the results of the simulations under ideal circumstances. In this case, we have three different classical optimizers and three ANSET C. The ZGR that has been previously introduced and the RY ANSATS with depths one and two that is used as a baseline. When it comes to optimizers, what we observe is that the best result is obtained by the Adam one, closely followed by the SPSA by having a look at these values of the continuous infidelity. This has the lower 
best ones. Why does this happen? The reason is that the Adam optimizer resorts to an analytic estimate of the host functions gradient, while SPSA relies on a stochastic one with errors that get amplified by a small denominator. And hence, even under the same values of the parameters for the simulation, Adam outperforms SPSA. If we now focus on the unset set, we see that the best result is obtained for the set GR as expected because it is designed to reproduce continuous functions. In the case of the ROI, the loss of information leads to the dropping of the minima and the vanishing of the gradients. And this effect, this scout of nature, is even more noticeable as the number of qubits and hence parameters increases. Nevertheless, it is worth pointing out that for different values of the parameters of the simulations, we obtain low infidelities of an order between 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the minus 5, in spite of the statistical uncertainty inherent to the evaluation of the bonds function. We study that, we have the following figure in which we have the stochastic path for the optimization for these values. And in this case, the uncertainty in the estimation of the energy is of order of 10 to the minus 2. If we go back, for these same values, we obtain an error of 10 to the minus 3. And this is below the previous one, pointing to the power of stochastic optimization. It is also interesting to acknowledge that with just three qubits, it means just eight points, we can recover a theoretical solution with a very high fidelity. Finally, it, we are going to study the limit that the number of valuation imposed in our approach by increasing the number of shots by a factor of four. When it comes to the error, it decreases by a factor of two, and this also affects the fidelity, as we obtain a, a better results as the number of measurements increases. Taking this into account, we can in fact conclude that this theoretical limit is observed in our algorithm, and the more evaluations we have, the closer we have to the infinite number of measurements and the better is the performance of the algorithm. Until now, we have focused on the study of our algorithm under ideal circumstances. However, current NIST devices are affected by noise sources. So in order to test the suitability of our approach for the current quantum computers, we have to test its performance under such noise sources. In order to do that, we use a simulator of a real quantum computer, the IBM Q Santiago computer provided by IBM. In this case, we use the RY answers with that one and the SPSA optimizer for the simulations. As they have a um, strong noise resilience, because this answer is the one with the lower number of quantum gates, and this optimizer is stochastic. If we have a look at the results for the noisy case, what we observe is that as the number of qubits increases, the fidelity decreases. And this is expected because the more qubits we have, the more quantum gates and error associated to them. In addition, the duration of the quantum circuit also increases and so does the effect of the coherence. Nevertheless, if we have a sufficiently small number of qubits, such as three, as we can see here, the infidelity of 10 is of order of 10 to the minus four. And we can recover the theoretical solution from the noisy measurements, which shows the noise resilience of our approach. Even though we have obtained such a good results for the image of the solution, when it comes to the, uh, to the properties associated to such solution, in this case, the error in the energy, the effect of the noise is very significant, as we can observe here. So in order to try to correct this effect, we are going to use error mitigation to obtain the ideal energy from the noisy measurements. More concretely, using the zero noise extrapolation technique applied to the thermal relaxation channel for the T1, thermal relaxation noise parameter. What we do is to prepare the quantum circuit with the optimum parameters and measure the associated energy for different values of this noise parameter. And this is what we obtain. We observe that such values admit a fifth order Taylor expansion that can be extrapolated to the zero noise case. We can also use another technique in the case which is extrapolation. And what we see is that for a state of the R values of T1 between 50 and 100 microseconds, we obtain an error of the energy that is of order 10 to the minus two, which means that we can, in fact, recover the theoretical energy from the noisy measurements. Well, I would like to finish by drawing the conclusions from this project. First, to point out what we have done. 
we have started by developing a series of quantum algorithms to encode continuous functions and differential operators in a quantum register by resorting to Fourier interpolation. This has allowed us to represent Hamiltonian PDEs in a quantum computers and to develop a variational quantum algorithm capable of solving them by using variational ansets that were suited for the description of such continuous functions and also for including their symmetries. Once a benchmark has been carried out, we have obtained high fidelity results, both under ideal and noisy circumstances. However, there is still room for improvement, and in the future, we would like to reduce the cost of this approach by using ansets with a lower scaling of the parameters with the number of qubits and less demanding gradient techniques. Even though we have obtained such good results in the estimation of the solution, when it comes to the energy, they were not so good. And the reason is the problem that the limitation in the number of measurement imposes. And this is, in fact, a real issue in current quantum computers in which this is limited due to the access and the temporal stability. And we cannot increase the number of evaluations as we would like in order to meet the experimental requirements in terms of the error. So what we propose is to consider as an alternative the use of quantum inspired methods for solving such problems, more concretely tensor networks. These methods can benefit from similar encodings and have also already shown heuristic advantages for solving the same kind of equations. That was the end of my presentation. I hope that you have enjoyed it. And thank you so much for your attention. Feel free, please feel free to ask any questions you have. Thank you very much, uh, Paula, for uh, these very nice results. So we have some uh, questions. Yes. Uh, let me start with the first one. Uh, when you set up the variational ansets, even yes. after applying symmetries, is there a trade-off between having more parameters, which can make the variational solution more accurate, and having fewer parameters to make the classical optimization and number of steps less costly? Yes. Mm, I mean, we can see the effect very good in this result. Uh, for, for this, this is the most accurate uh, classical optimizer. So what we observe is that increasing the number of qubits and hence the number of parameters make the, makes this more accurate as the solution has a better fidelity. But there is a moment that when you start increasing such number of, of qubits, you don't obtain such a good results because you know these barring plateaus that make the optimization very difficult for the classical optimizer. And in addition, the number of qubits this increase makes also much more costly in terms of the execution time. So yes, there, there is a trade-off. So you have to find the balance between how much you want your algorithm to take and also the error that you want to obtain. So maybe here it is not worth increasing the number of qubits above four if you already have a, such a good result and it takes much less time. So you have to slide that, please. Okay, thank you. There is a question from the chat from Alfredo Jaramillo and uh, he's asking, can you give some insight, insights on the whole computational complexity of the algorithm? Uh, for instance, is there uh, some dependence of this complexity with a type of PDA, for instance, if it's uh, of 2D or 3D, or if it's of mm -hmm. higher order and so on? So Yes. Yeah, well, currently we have focused on one dimensional um, PDEs in, in our paper. You can find uh, another PDE, the one of the transform qubit. And of course, if you increase the dimensions, you will have to increase the complexity to the Fourier transform in multi-dimensional space. Um, when it comes to the to this equation, well, it, it can also be seen as in the as we show in the paper that in this case this equation behaves very good because you have that this exactly vanishes to zero. Um, it is it can make it can be periodic in this interval. You can make it periodic. But when you have a form that not, does not behave so good, you need more qubits in order to achieve the same order for the fidelity. So depending on your equation, you are going to have more or less trouble. And also on the number of qubits, you have a better or a worse error due to the free interpolation. OK, maybe then the last question. So yes. what is the likelihood of seeing a practical quantum advantage from these types of variational algorithms? Uh, are they going to be limited by the quantum devices or the classical optimization? 
Well, I think that uh, currently for this concrete version algorithm, because there are a lot of them nowadays and they are all different in some ways. For this one, we cannot still achieve this quantum advantage. We can see here, you just see that this would be the theoretical value for an infinite number of measurements. And you can even see that this is well below it. And the reason is the number of evaluations. You have to increase it a lot in order to obtain a good result. And this is not just feasible with the limitations that we have. Um, moreover, with the effect of noise that as we have seen also modifies the results in terms of the fidelity. So I think that for this algorithm, this is the first limitation, but also the classical limitation that has to be more studied in order to avoid these parent plateaus. Okay. Thank you very much, Paula. So. You're welcome. I'm going to stop sharing. Good. Thanks, Paula, also from my side. Um, and uh, next in our lineup is Gadi Afek uh, speaking about precision searches for new physics using optically levitated sensors. Gadi, stage is yours. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So let me just. Okay. Great. Uh, thanks, Christian. Thanks, Oriol. And thanks, everyone, for inviting me to this really remarkable um, seminar series. And the story I'm going to tell you about today is related to how we're searching new physics and, and, and dark matter using optically levitated sensors, such as this um, 10 micron uh, silica sphere levitated in the middle of, the, of a vacuum chamber using uh, an optical tweezer, basically. So I thought I'd start us off with this beautiful picture of the Andromeda galaxy, whose uh, rotation curves, namely the rotation velocity of a star as a function of its distance from the center of the galaxy, uh, provide one of the most compelling evidence, even though not the only one by, all, by no means, of the fact that the matter we know how to predict using, or we know how to understand using the standard model of particle physics is just a small fraction of the total matter there is. And in fact, the majority of the matter in the universe, 80% of it is what we call dark matter. So what do we know about dark matter? Let me put it shortly, not a lot. We know that it interacts using, uh, interacts with standard model or with normal matter using gravity. We know that uh, um, it can interact maybe with using other interactions. Take for example, the, the mass range, right? So this is the, ma the available mass range for dark matter to be. It's huge in terms of like 60 orders of magnitude or even more. And um, people are looking for different types of models. An example or two, two prominent examples are these weakly interacting massive particles and the axions. And they're compelling in the sense that they solve dark matter problems and also other problems that we have. Uh, however, um, for three decades now, these tan scale WIMP searches have not found anything yet. And, and in fact, for axions, the parameter space is only getting bigger, uh, so bigger that people have to get to uh, beyond standard quantum uh, limit measurements to, to be able to search faster, such as this uh, nice reference. And um, maybe it's also worth saying that there are a, a huge number of other models that have not been ruled out and, and are still allowed. So we have to search for everything. But how would a standard, how, how would a model independent search look? So a search that only relies on gravity. So take, for example, this thought experiment published in this, in this very nice paper, where you have an array of pendula. They can only interact using gravity. There's no other backgrounds. And then you're looking for a whooshing dark matter particle that goes flying through. As this dark matter particle goes flying through, the uh, pendulum will, will move, and um, maybe you can sense the, the dark matter passing. Now, if you put in the numbers, you'll see that for you need in order for this thing to be sensitive enough to have enough rate, you need huge dark matter masses. This is the Planck mass, which is 20 micrograms. And you need to be 30 dB beyond the standard quantum limit in a cryogenic system with a billion sensors, right? So this, at this moment, is not you know, viable. But what can you be looking for? Well, you can look for models in which dark matter has stronger interaction than just gravity. So you can imagine adding a long range force from some new boson, or you can imagine having some weak mixing into standard model, um, for example, electromagnetism. And then uh, maybe you can find 
these things. Now, um, um, for that, you need a very good force or acceleration sensor. And what I want to claim is optomechanical systems are very precise force sensors. As a community, we know now how to control uh, mass scales ranging from a kilogram mass in the LIGO mirrors to a single ion in, in, a, in a trap. And uh, our specific system uses roughly a 10 nanogram mass. So it's in the middle of this logarithmic mass scale with uh, acceleration sensitivity, which is now technically limited at around 100 nano G, where G is the Earth's uh, 9.8 meters per second square um, per root hertz acceleration sensitivity. Um, how does it look? How does the system look? So, so this is the sphere. In reality, it's much smaller. Um, it can be between 5 and 30 microns in diameter and can be a variety of different materials. We like the large spheres because they give us better acceleration sensitivity. And this sphere is trapped on a uh, single beam 1064 nanometer, what's called a gravito optical configuration in vacuum uh, with a bunch of optical elements, which I'll explain in a second. And um, we use a low NA beam so that we can have optic, um, um, access to probe from a short distance. We have another um, uh, laser line at 532 to image the sphere. And then we put this image onto a, an array of sensors um, to sense the center of mass and the rotational degrees of freedom, feed those back into an FPGA and uh, feed back on the motion of the sphere using a piezo-activated mirror, an AOM and an EOM for the separate degrees of freedom. And that way we can apply feedback. Now these things trap for a long time, for like a month until we're sick of them and put our hand in the laser and, and throw them out. And um, when you try to compare optically levitated systems, so this is the acceleration sensitivity again in these same units, as a function of the levitated sphere mass, you can see that these um, microspheres, the levitated microspheres uh, go to very, very good acceleration sensitivity. In fact, the best for optically levitated uh, objects. We're still, by the way, 100 uh, times uh, worse than the standard quantum limit, and this is technically limited. So how does the experimental sequence look like? You take a bunch of spheres, you glue them, you, you, you put them on a, on a cover slip, and then you shake the cover slip very hard, and then sometimes one of them gets trapped. And then you pump the chamber down to roughly 10 to the minus 7 uh, tor, that's our base pressure. The spheres are typically um, charged, negatively charged, and then uh, you need to discharge them. So the way we do that is we apply an electric field and zap them with a UV lamp. And if you look at this plot showing the charge as a function of time, as the, so this is the excess charge in electrons. As we zap the UV, la the UV lamp, the charge is uh, extracted from the sphere. If, if we zoom on this little rectangle here, you can see we can even cross zero. So this is an excess of protons and then reverse the process, uh, which I can explain later if anyone's interested. And then if you zoom in on this uh, uh, rectangle, then you see this beautiful single electron steps as the sphere gets discharged up to the point where it has exactly the same number of protons and electrons on a 10 to the 15 nucleon object. They, once they're discharged, they stay discharged for like a week. This is a yocto amp of current. It's the smallest SI unit of current. And then you can, uh, if you want, spin them up using the, the, rotation, the, the circular polarization of the trapping beam. They can spin up to rotational speeds of about 10 megahertz. And once they're spun up, they're stable and you can uh, cool them down. So we use our feedback to cool the center of mass motion of the sphere. This is the power spectral density in units of meters per root hertz. So this is an angstrom per root hertz as a function of frequency. And the integral over this power spectral density is the temperature. And you can see that as you crank up your feedback, your dissipative feedback, then the temperature reduces until it hits our noise, which is around 50 microvolts. Nice, so you have all of that, but you wanna measure something. So what, what can we measure? If you consider um, models of dark matter in which the interaction is a little bit stronger than gravitational interaction. Uh, you can think of this, of this specific uh, family of models, well-motivated models, where the dark matter is heavy and it interacts um, using this Yukawa type interaction with a long range force carrier, a long range mediator. So here alpha is the coupling per neutron and n neutron is the number of neutrons in your sphere. So you have a force which is long range enough such that it, it can interact with all of the nucleons in your sphere together. And that gives you a huge coherent enhancement in the cross section of the number of nucleons squared, that's 10 to the 30. 
How do you test that? Well, you take your sphere and then you, you charge it up with a single electron and you apply a pulse, a momentum pulse in your electric field. And then you see how the sphere moves. So this is the displacement, the calibration of the displacement of the sphere as a function of time. You hit a pulse, an electric pulse at time zero, and then you see basically the ring down of a driven damped harmonic oscillator. This is two nanometers, by the way. This is the ring down of a, of a driven damped harmonic oscillator. And then you discharge the sphere, you let it go, and you look at it for a long time. Uh, our momentum threshold is 200 MeV per C in these units, which is basically like feeling um, an E. coli land on your shoulder from a micron height. Right? So usually people uh, measure the exposure of these sensors in 10 years. And I just want to point out that this um, uh, experiment, for example, is a nanogram day exposure. So um, you, you look at the sphere and you analyze the, the, the impulses and we don't see anything that is you know, uh, um, consistent with dark matter, but we can put conservative model independent limits. So these are the limits on the coupling to neutrons uh, as a function of the dark matter mass here in GeV per C square, and as a function of the mediator mass. And you can compare those with these tan scale uh, WIMP detectors, which for this specific models are much less sensitive, many orders of magnitude less sensitive. And this is only a first proof of, of principle. It's a weak uh, data with one sphere. So what else can you do? Well, the first thing you can do is uh, acknowledge that this thing is sensitive to directionality. So if you are able to sense the direction from which these recoils are coming, then you have a smoking gun evidence in, this modula in the modulation of, a, of the direction coming from the way that the Earth moves or the, the Earth moves inside the galaxy. And this thing is a really smoking gun evidence for the existence of dark matter. Another thing you can do is you can go to large arrays of these spheres, right? And then you increase your cross-section such as people are doing brilliantly now with cold atoms. And you can increase the sensitivity of your measurement too and even beyond the standard quantum limit. And this is a projection. So this is the, the results I've just shown you. And, and these are projections to what would happen if you had a hundred sphere array or if you had a hundred sphere array at the standard quantum limits. So this is one example of the way that dark matter can interact in a stronger way than just gravity. Another example is it can couple to electromagnetism. So the way you can think about it is imagine that there is some sort of dark electromagnetism where a dark matter particle has unity charge. And this thing couples very, very weakly to standard model electromagnetism. And then it would appear as if you have a particle with a charge, which is a fraction of the charge of the electron, okay? So these are called millicharge, confusingly, they're called millicharge particles. It can be a nanocharge or a microcharge. And um, if you want to see a recoil from such a particle, then the system I just proposed is terrible, right? Because the charge to mass ratio is very bad. You have a massive object. And in fact, it's 10 to the nine times worse than, for example, a single strontium ion in a trap, or even 10 to the 14 worse than a single trapped electron. You can look at this um, reference uh, to, for more information. And, um, but, but in fact, if you think of normal protons and electrons, you don't see them whooshing around so much. They form bound states. So if you can uh, imagine a bound state in which a positive nucleus, nucleus has a millicharged particle bound to it, forming some sort of millicharged atom. And if this thing, if this is silicon, for example, it can get jammed in our sphere, maybe in the early universe. And if this thing exists in the sphere, then the sphere has a small charge. How can you test that? What we do is the following, we take the sphere and then we charge it up with a known amount of electrons and put it in a oscillating field and measure how it moves. The next thing you do is you kick out these electrons, you're left with exactly the same number of protons and electrons on the sphere, and then you ramp up the field to be very, very strong and check if there's any residual motion left, right? And if there's a residual motion left, then you can say, or if there's no residual motion left, then you can uh, detect or put a limit on the abundance of these millicharged particles in your material. And in fact, you can also say uh, that this is a statement regarding the neutrality of matter, which surprisingly is still an open question. And so the sum of the charge of the proton, electron, and neutron is basically an experimental fact that it's zero and it's bound to 10 to the minus 21 of the charge of the electron. So we're basically taking a chunk of material and measuring its neutrality. Now, what we do is we take 76 nanograms, 
these number of spheres of different sizes and we repeat this experiment and then we can put bounds on the abundance of these millicharged particles at 10 to the minus 17 millicharged particles per nucleon, which is something like 10 parts in a quintillion, and, um, and, and, and convert through uh, Bohr binding to a uh, parameter space where there's fractional charge. So this is the charge of the millicharged particle as a function of this dark matter mass and compare to other uh, very nice uh, searches and in fact, this is our line. So for the abundance stated here, we put a bound in this parameter space on uh, the existence of mini charged particles, closing this huge gap. Uh, our results are again, technically limited down to 10 to the minus 19 electrons per nucleon, which is lower than the best limit until now, but um, there's still room for improvement. So I talked to you about the search for recoils from composite dark matter and this search for charge quantization and millicharge particles as a paradigm of you know, um, uh, detection, mechanical detection of dark matter. This is by no means the only thing that we're doing in the lab. We're looking for uh, deviations from Newton's law at micron distances. We're looking at um, alpha recoils from the spheres for nuclear forensics. We're building arrays of these nanogram masses, trying to control the dipole backgrounds, which is the second uh, multipole uh, after we've controlled the charge. And we're looking into whispering gallery mode spectroscopy of these spheres with hopes of being able to do something like Dr. Poon. Um, with that, I want to thank uh, the, the team, uh, specifically Dave and my advisor and everyone else in the funding and uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gary, for this very nice um, uh, talk. So we have some questions. So let me start with the first one. So um, is it, I mean, how important is that the sphere is really round and uh, on, on, mm -hmm. on, namely on what scale do these irregular, irregularities matter? So yeah, so in fact, they're not very round. We use spheres uh, that are grown in a very messy process uh, for basically for biology experiments. And they are they're around up to a percent or a 10 percent uh, um, level. And this thing is important, but since we spin them up very fast, then we can kind of average out these uh, irregularities. But that's true that the, uh, this causes, for example, the rotation dynamics to leak into our center of mass sensitivity. Um, so this is something we worry about, yes. And uh, there was a question about the dipole uh, backgrounds that you mentioned just at the very end. So how relevant it is and uh, how, what is the plan to control them? Great question. So the, they're very relevant. In fact, they're the most prominent background we have for the millicharge particle experiment. Um, the plan to control them is as follows. So if you, if you spin the sphere up very fast, you're left with a permanent dipole moment pointing in the Z direction. What you can then do is you can apply a DC field and if the sphere is spinning very fast, the, the uh, dipole would process. And you can think about it as some sort of classical analog to uh, pi pulse, right? Or to, uh, to, to some sort of quantum control. And if you can do something like take a measurement here and then do a pi pulse, a controlled pi pulse, and take a measurement here and then do another pi pulse. So I'm saying pi pulse, of course, with every needed. Um, and and uh, yeah, so that would allow you to cancel these dipole backgrounds. And in fact, we have some nice preliminary results on that. Cool. And uh, in the process of discharging the spheres, um, could you explain a bit more how do you make sure you end up with zero charges? Because maybe you yeah. are ending, you end up by overshooting yeah, sure. many so, positive so, ones. So what we do is we, we apply an electric field, an oscillating electric field, and then measure the position of the sphere and correlate it with the oscillating electric field. And then that gives you basically the, the charge. Now, as you go, so you can see this correlation changing sign. That's how you know you crossed zero. And then if you increase the field more and more, you apply a single um, UV pulse and you see the steps. And because it's a Poisson process, you know that the smallest step, step that you see is a single electron. You just take a few steps and, and, you, can, um, and you know that you have a single electron, you can calibrate to that. And the reversing of the direction is done by changing the amplitude of the field. So here we extract electrons from the sphere. And here we basically kick electrons off neighboring gold surfaces and just jam them onto the sphere. Cool. 
And maybe the last question you mentioned that uh, so far you the experiments are hundred uh, a factor hundred away from the standard quantum limit. Yeah. So what is the plan to cool to cool a bit more these these big particles? Right. So so yeah. So first, let me point out that nanospheres are basically at the standard quantum limit at this point. The frequency of our experiments are is much lower, so it's harder to get to the standard quantum limit. Right now, we're technically limited. Uh, so if you could, for example, get rid of some pointing noise that we have in our lasers and go to ultra high vacuum, you'd be almost there. So that's in, in terms of technical uh, limitations. Then you can think of pulsed uh, detection. You can think of you know, squeezing to go beyond, but that's the, the limit we're, we're experiencing now. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. That was great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gadi. Um, so let's move over to uh, move over to our next speaker. And next in line is uh, Chi Shu, uh, and he will talk about quantum enhanced uh, optical lattice clock. So Chi, just go ahead. Thanks, Christian. Um, can you hear me well? Okay, great. Yes. Uh, so um, I'm Chi Shu. I'm a PhD student at Harvard Physics and MIT. Uh, I also want to thank the organizer to give me the chance to share our recent progress in quantum enhanced optical lattice clock to see like how we actually use quantum entanglement to go beyond the standard uh, quantum limit. Um, there, there are two things to, I, I'm going to touch today. One is our recent publication, Nature, the entanglement, like uh, we actually perform an entanglement enhanced optical clock phase measurement uh, with um, entanglement among like a, a couple hundreds of items that measuring a laser oscillating at hundreds of terahertz. After that, I'll tell you our latest progress using our ability to reverse the quantum evolution in time to perform quantum methodology with non-Gaussian state, which actually showed on archive a few days ago. Uh, one of the limitations of the state of uh, the optical like a uh, lattice clock is the quantum projection noise. So imagine what you're trying to measure is the state of like a single spin hop. That is very similar like you're doing a coin flip. You flip it once, you could, would get only head or tail, but you will never get any fraction number between them. If you want to improve your measurement with less error, what you're doing would be just try to measure the same atomic state with like multi multiple times or with, or with multiple copies of the same state. Then the error of the projection measurement of any superposition state with n copies can be quantified as the binomial distribution with here, the, the P as the probability of finding the spin ups at n as the number of the copies. And we call this like a, a quantum projection noise. So in this case, like when you, you have all spin halves as in the same state, we could actually represent them in the collective block sphere. And the, in the spin polarized cases, we call it like coherent spin state. Similar to the photonic coherent state, the coherent spin state has this equal distribution of the noise along all directions and is bounded by the Heisenberg uncertain principle. With that, you can actually calculate yourself on uh, the uncertainty along any axis would, would scale with one over square root n, uh, basically due to the independent copies of like the same atomic state. Uh, optical lattice clock limited by such a system would have been called like a, with, the, with the stability limit with the, by the standard quantum limit, which is scale as the equation I showed to follow here. The signature here you see is the number of, it's scale with number item over like a square root n, and the scale with the, um, the time you try to do the averaging uh, with square root like in the, the time you do the averaging. An obvious way to improve the standard quantum limit is by packing with more items. However, in general, that's like uh, technically difficult and come with other problems. So we're trying to do a different route here. What we're doing is we try to use quantum entanglement among multiple items, try to improve the performance, and then to have like a, a quantum enhanced optical lattice clock. With a, in, with the like a, still bounded by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, we could redistribute noise with one of axis with the reduced noise, we call it squeeze axis. And at the price that you're paying with the, the other axis with the increased noise, we call it the anti squeeze axis. With that, if you align your squeeze axis to the axis of interest in our case, the phase axis on the block sphere, you actually could have uh, enhanced the capability of the optical lattice clock. Um, I do want to mention here, there's still a fundamental limit in this kind of system, which is called the Heisberg limit. That's the one you have a maximum amount of entanglement state with almost all noise distributed along the anti-squeeze axis. And the value is always bounded by the uncertainty principle with one over N. So how to create the spin squeeze state on optical clock transition? Let's look at the energy diagram of Euterbium 171, which is the item we used. 
Ethereum Y71 has this like super narrow like a transition as a like yellow color at 578 nanometer with seven millihertz. That is 21 seconds long. It could be trapped in the optical lattice at 759 nanometer. Thus we can actually probe like um, many, many items, thousands of items at the same time and do the averaging frequency calculation. We have showed previously, actually we are able to do the spin squeezing on the like ground state, the one of the specific quantum entanglement state. What if we can transfer using optical pipes, transfer on state to the clock state? Then at that moment, we should have quantum entanglement on the optical clock transition. What we can do later is we can transfer the state back and try to do the performance, like to, to do the detection of the atomic state on the ground state, where we have relatively good like uh, measurement resolution. The Hamiltonian we try to engineering for the like uh, the quantum entanglement on ground state or the spin squeeze cases, uh, we use a one twisting Hamiltonian, which has a form in SC squared. SC is a rotation generator, so you can view what happened is like you originally have a coin spin state. You have a rotation on the upper block sphere rotated one direction and lower block sphere rotated the other direction. Under the evolution of this Hamiltonian, we're able to form into this like shared cases with the amount of shearing we quantify as a Q and with the squeeze axis and anti squeeze axis as you expected. The way we create the Hamiltonian is as follows. We have like uh, the, uh, we have like here showed you a sub level like one is zero to should be one transitions. With the external magnetic field, the excited state are well separated. If we have optical cavity with high finance, like a uh, unresonance coupled to let's say one half to three half transition in this like a uh, uh, two level systems. If you then send your laser through the cavity, you will observe what they call the vacuum rabbit splitting. The splitting between the peaks of vacuum rabbit splitting scale with the square root of number of items on the, on the up transition, which unresonance with this light, as well as the, like, the decay rate of your cavity, decay rate of a transition, uh, and the, the number which is quantified the strength of the single photon coupled to a single item in this optical cavity, which is called cooperativity. It's basically a value dependent only on the finance and the geometry of your cavity. If now you park your laser, let's say off resonance to one of the peaks here, which show like in black, then when your laser actually dressed as a state on the end up and actually generate AC stock shift on these levels. Now the total Hamiltonian has a turn scale with number of items on this level, as well as the amount of AC stock shift. However, the amount of AC stock depends on number of photons in the cavity. As I showed here, if I have a little bit different item number, then the black line becomes the gray line. Actually, the amount of photons in the cavity does have a dependence on the amount of item on this level as well. So now you end up with the terms, has a term both like a, with the SC square. There's, you probably noted there's a single a rotation term ASD here, which we cancel with the spin echo and the re, uh, keep evolution of the state. One thing I do want to mention here, if you switch the sign of the, of the like, um, detuning, you, the, the dependence on the number of photons to the, to the items will be the same, but then you switch the sign of the detuning to the atomic transitions. That actually helps you to switch the sign of the Hamiltonian of this like one twisting Hamiltonian. And I want to emphasize here, this is how we are able to do like a quantum time reverse quantum evolution later uh, I'm going to talk about. Here's some theoretical simulation of the parameter space. On the x-axis, you see the detuning of your laser uh, away from the atomic transition and the cavity. And here, the Q represent the amount of shearing strength or the strength of your Hamiltonian applying. As I promised you before, you can see if I switch the sign, here the blue color represent negative value and red color represent the positive value. If I switch the sign, you can see I did switch the sign of the, the like uh, quantum evolution. And the F here represent the state broadening, which is, which is like a, how we quantify how unitary the process is. And the dashed line is the violent parameter, which would promise you like how well if you only do the spin squeezing going to be. In the case of spin squeezing, we just want to park at the maximum amount of like a violent parameter, inverse of violent parameter here. And then later I will also show you like a, by changing the sign of the detuning where how we evolve back the state. With that, like we, I want to show you the first result we have using spin squeezing on the optical clock transition. Here we did the tomography of the state by like measuring the variance of the state uh, while like we do different rotation of the state. In purple here represent the, like when we generate spin squeeze with our one twisting Hamiltonian on the ground state, like one half manifold. And then in the yellow here represent the data. Once we generate that state and we transfer with the pipe house, optical pipe house to the clock state and transfer back. 
as you see, the both like yellow and the purple data match pretty well. And the blue here represents just a, a case without squeezing on the optical clock transition. So that actually shows you as a reference. So with the success of the transferring the spin squeeze, the entanglement state to the optical clock transition in the back, we said, okay, why not just try to do this, do a Ramsey sequence and measure the performance enhancement. With that, like the blue data here showing you the data with the coin spin state, the typical cases of almost all the group was doing. And the, in the red cases showing the case with input with the spin squeeze state. This case is the squeeze axis was pointing along the face axis. And actually you can see the spin squeeze that actually below the coin spin state. However, you may be wondering like why this is above the standard coin limit at, which is different as I promised you before. That is because actually we are using the spin squeeze state to measure real phase of optical clock laser that oscillating in hundreds of terahertz. We have a laser phase, we have a laser which actually defaces from atomic transitions and we actually are measuring a real signal here. We, we actually could also quantify the amount of laser noise by like using a longer Ramsey time. Actually we did that and we actually removed that amount of laser noise there to just show you how well this actually really above the standard coin limit mathematically. And you can see this actually showing a 4.4 dB better than the standard coin limit. And this is actually the first time ever anyone using quantum entanglement with the hundreds of items to measure real optical laser phase also in hundreds of terahertz. With that, I want to switch the gear a little bit to our recent progress. While we are trying to improve our optical clock laser to have a longer current time in optical lattice clock to showing you a real operational like a state of art op in quantum enhanced optical lattice clock, we're thinking like how we could improve our like a spin squeezing protocol on the ground state. One of the limitation here I forgot to mention here is like in order to resolve the amount of squeezing here, you need very good like a measurement, atomic state detection. However, that's generally very, very hard. Like most of group only have like a measurement resolution just around like the quantum projection noise of current spin state. Here, we actually use the time reverse the quantum metrology to get the largest ever quantum improvement of any interferometer to date. The way we're doing so is, so is as follows. We originally have the current spin state. We evolve, as I previously mentioned, with this like one situation Hamiltonian into this like quantum entanglement state. With now you have the, the one of the reduced axis along like the direction here, the squeeze axis. Now, if you imagine you try to sense a signal phi, which should rotate along the y direction. This phi actually displays on state just a little bit enough to actually distinguish these two state which are actually much smaller than the, the width of the coin spin state as I showed here. Now, imagine you try to evolve back as I promised you before, just change the sign of the tuning, evolve back the state. Supposedly the original state go back to coin spin state, the new state go back to something very similar to coin spin state. However, due to this shearing or twisting Hamiltonian happening, the, the small displacement along the SC actually displays hugely along the SY. Now you have the state with the same amount of noise as typical system, like the standard quantum limit, but with the amplifier, the signal. Here's a little animation of what's happening. You can see the squeezing, the displacement, and the back evolution. And here are some data of the evolution. We have the forward evolution and we take the screenshot of all the sections at different time for the anti-squeezing axis. We originally have this Gaussian looking things and then we eventually evolve, evolve to enough that we even like go away from the Gaussian uh, shape and go to this two peaks showed up. And as I promised before, if I switch the sign now of the evolution, then actually goes back to almost like original coin spin state. The width here actually slightly broadened by the compared to the original state. And that is due to uh, the non-unitary portion of, the, of this Hamiltonian. Here is the signal amplification happening here. The x-axis is represent the amount of displacement we purposely put it there by sending IF rotations and y-axis is the projection of the spin state. In black, it's representing a slope one to guide your eye. So as you clearly see, all of them has a slope much, much larger than one. With the more and more squeezing apply or more and more the Hamiltonian we apply, actually we have the, this slope become larger and larger until the moment uh, actually the, the contrast decay of the block sphere start to kick in and then you start to like uh, paying the price of like doing too much of your Hamiltonian. Once I do want to emphasize here, normally nobody going to this param parameter space for just using a spin squeeze state. 
because in these cases, the state becomes so much like away from the Gaussian, uh, Gaussian profile, like this two, the, the two actually under squeezing has a leakage into the squeeze axis and you no longer be able to enjoy your like a reduced uh, noise in your quantum protocol. However, this could actually, this could be measured in the case when we're using this like a uh, uh, quantum evolution, like a time reverse quantum evolution. Here's uh, some uh, like, uh, like a basic characterization of it. In here, axes represent the strength of the shearing apply, where axes represent the amplification. As I showed you here, we have uh, like a slope up to like uh, almost five here. And the, down here, I'm showing you basically the noise of the state. In black is before the reverse evolution, and in gray here is after you do the like a time reverse uh, evolution. And clearly we have the state only broadened by like a, around just factor two. And then now basically you can calculate the amount of like quantum enhancement you could gain by calculating the amount of, by dividing the amount of amplification square to the amount of the variance you have on the state, uh, basically the amount of noise in your measurement. With that, uh, like we actually could quantify this and we have like a, a clearly above 10 dB uh, for using this quantum enhanced protocol. So with that, why not we just try with a real protocol, like measuring something real, a real face? That's what exactly what we did. We're using this like a, a time versus the uh, quantum metrology protocol to measure AC like a Ramsey sequence to try to sense like the phase difference between this AC uh, of Ramsey here. And in purple here, we showed you data with just using the coin spin state as you normally would use. And in red, we're showing you the case with our like quantum enhanced protocols. And here you can clearly see there's a 15 times improvement in linear scales for the like uh, uh, the amount of the stability we apply we got for the like measuring this phase, as well as we can actually measure with same stability but 15 times faster. That would be very significant if this signal would take like let's say a year to measure. Now it takes less than a month. With that, I want to show you a summary plot of all different experiment has been done uh, with like a spin squeezing or like quantum enhancement. Um, here in the red representing our data, we measure the same kind of protocol with different item numbers and we have a scaling uh, shows like almost one or n over n. That's very similar to the Heisenberg limit, meaning like we have a fixed distance from the Heisenberg limit. I want to mention here the star here represent the measuring of real phase as I talked about here, and that's actually the largest among any system to date. Uh, with that, like I want to just briefly conclude like a, we actually have achieved the quantum entanglement of the clock transition. We also achieved like 15 times quantum improvement with time reverse quantum metrology on the ground state. And the, the next obvious next step we'll do is we trying to do the improve our uh, optical clock laser coherence. Uh, we are also trying right now doing the squeezing while rotating to, to try to measure some interesting state as well as doing the reverse of that protocol. And the one thing, uh, one, one thing we're also thinking is try to do Martin ensemble clocks try to show you a real uh, comparison between squeeze clocks. Uh, with that, I want to show you the members of the team of Lennon Wiltich is the PI. He's very uh, optimistic about the experiment and the Edwin Simone, the postdocs, as well as my like fellow graduate students, Ziang and Ricky. And thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much Xu, for this very nice talk. So we have some questions. The so first one is, um, what is the trade-off in building clocks between the advantages of squeezing versus a reduced probe time because of the coherence? Uh, what are the near-term opportunities for this to impact practical and or uh, high precision clocks? Right, um, so I do want you, I mean, I think the, the, this is very good questions. Like, uh, I think like a, it's always good idea to recycle the items so like you can like uh, reduce the, the the delay time between like each time of you do the clock probing. Um, that's actually could possible in our system because actually we're using the cavity to detect the atomic state. This is like a non a non like basically non destruction measurement, and we could actually recycle the systems. Um, and uh, but I think the the basically the, the 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 question is more also asking like how you practically use this like spin squeeze state, let's say for the quantum metrology. There's some price you're actually paying in, in using the spin squeeze state. Typically, when you with more squeezing, a little bit decoherence, single, single, let's say single item decoherence will actually will cost you more. Uh, I think the main advantage of using spin squeeze state is like you can actually measure faster. So you can able to access the higher bandwidth of, of any signals. And that actually could be a really practical things for uh, for like imagine you want to detect in, uh, something like a gravitational wave or something like that. Thanks. Um, next question is, in this uh, time reverse, uh, reversal uh, QM 
uh, limited, so sorry, so the, with these time reversal ideas, is this limited to symmetric states you can generate in one axis uh, uh, twisting, or can this be generalized to entangled states with large quantum Fisher information? Uh, and in that case, uh, what if you would have short range interactions? So th th that is a really good question. Like I forgot to mention here, like I'm going pretty fast here. So the real thing happening here because you have much larger quantum efficient information compared to the original uh, core and spin state. Uh, so with that, actually, if you are able, imagine if you are able to evolve this into a high efficient information, try to use that small efficient, uh, high efficient information measure something and evolve it back, then yes, I think it could, could still work. Uh, there's a little bit of price you're paying because when you apply another times of this Hamiltonian, there's additional contrast loss as well as the non unitary portion of the things. Uh, I briefly does mention here, uh, we also trying to apply with like a much more complicated like a Hamiltonian instead of a single one x twisting, we also apply rotation while doing that, uh, that one x twisting. And we try to also currently try to think of like evolve it back. And we think that should actually gain us more uh, compared to like what actually we just with a simple like spin squeezing as I showed here. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And maybe the last question uh, regarding the first part: How does the, this method you presented of preparing uh, squeezing by a unitary dynamics uh, compare with methods based on performing uh, collective quantum measurements? Right, that's that's a wonderful question. Like, uh, so um, wh whenever like uh, you try to imagine, so I guess the, the question is more related to like uh, to, to the projection measurement. Like, uh, imagine you try to do a non demotion measurement. Uh, so the price you are paying for both systems is like any information leaked to the environment does broaden the state. Like theoretically, everything is unitary in quantum. So if you imagine you imagine every photon scattered from your system, you could feed back to your state, and that's still doing unitary. However, that's practically very, very hard. Nobody is able to have like a perfect quantum efficiency. Here in our evolution, so we go actually purposely go away from the peaks, which has a lot of fish information, like uh, we call it fish information, basically the information in the light uh, for the atomic state. So then with that, uh, the scattering or the transmission of light has carried very little information. So actually we don't care that the amount of information leak. Uh, so that actually uh, ensure us to have very little like broadening or non unitary portion of our evolution. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll pass the mic now to, to Christian. Okay, so many thanks uh, again to all three of you, Paula, Gadi, and Chi. Uh, that was a great session today. Um, and what remains is to announce the quantum science seminar number 57 uh, next week, and the speaker will be Meta Atatürk. So goodbye. See you everyone next week.